Welcome, everyone. So you are sitting here staring at this group of experts, and they're going to tell us lots of great information today. But a lot of the reason we're gathering is because of you. You are what we describe as the village, and you care about cybersecurity, you care about our elections and democracy, and we are all interested in helping you go and be the village and secure the village. So what does that mean? Well, it means something different to everyone, right? I mean, for some of us, it may mean going to volunteer and get a little bit more involved in things like our elections. And for others, it's to um, be maybe a thoughtful citizen and talk about some of these issues amongst your peers. But whatever that is, we want you to do it. And we want you to be really thoughtful because there's never been a greater time to be more thoughtful about the place and the space that only you occupy. There are people that follow you that don't follow me, that don't follow Stan and don't follow Kathy and all of our fabulous speakers here, but they listen to you and you are a thought leader in your space. So have that in mind today as you're learning and listening from our experts and make sure that by the time you're done here, you are actually thinking about action. You're thinking about how to action on what you've learned and that thing inside of you that knows that you need to stay involved and stay a part of the discussion. So with that said, we're going to get into some of the fabulousness that is Secure the Village so you understand who we are as the host of this discussion today. So Stan, will you roll our video, please? Cybersecurity isn't simple, so if you think you're about to watch a cute video with bouncy music that tells you how what you thought was hard is actually easy, and what you thought was complicated is actually just like one, two, three, rest assured, this isn't it. Because cybersecurity isn't simple, and what we do weaves together law, technology, risk management, governance, public policy, education, political philosophy, psychology, and even questions of freedom. And of war and peace. Cybersecurity isn't simple, but the values that motivate us are. The value that says we should treat others' information as we would like our information to be treated. That cybersecurity is an urgent civic duty for the 21st century citizen. And the value that says none of us is as smart as all of us. And that's why we're getting everyone involved. Building bridges between those who dedicate their lives to cybersecurity and helping everyday citizens complete that last mile. Transforming our neighbors into powerful cyber guardians. Cybersecurity isn't simple, but the values that motivate us are. And our values say that there's a seat at the table for anyone with something to contribute to the global exchange of knowledge we're building at Secure the Village. Because from the boardroom to the living room, it takes a village to secure the village. Thank you, thank you, Stan. So that was about us, that's Secure the Village. So now I'm going to introduce, um, of course, the founder of Secure the Village. This is Stan Stahl, PhD. He is, again, founder, and he's also um, a Director of Information Security at Miller Kaplan, where he brings his information security management expertise to midsize and smaller businesses and nonprofits. And in addition, I mean, you see him out there on LinkedIn sharing the, sharing the word of all the things that we're discussing here today, and it is to build a community a community of people just like you who are experts in this space. So we hope that you're gonna stick close to Secure the Village and help us be a part of all of this great work that we're doing here. Um, now, Stan, I'm gonna do a tiny bit of housekeeping and then we're gonna dive right into our session. So questions today, we know you will have them. At least we hope you will articulate them. Sometimes we walk away with questions unasked, but today we hope you will ask them. Use that questions box, please. And um, we will get to them in our Q&A portion of the session. And at the end, which we hope you'll stick to, there will be a survey that will pop up because we wanna know how we can best serve you. And to dive right in now to the material, I'm gonna pass it off to Stan Stahl. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. For, thanks, first of all, for the participants, the people who are joining us. Uh, and, and thanks especially to our, 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 our panelists, uh, Brandon uh, Wales from CISA, uh, Kathy Bookvar from uh, the Center for Internet Security, and Adam Powell III from uh, USC. Uh, and uh, I want, every, I want to spend the first few minutes just let everybody introduce themselves. Uh, say 
a little bit about who you are, what, what you're about, and, you know, kind of what your organization is and how it kind of fits into the whole, because the election system is is a very complex, complicated uh, kind of thing, if you will. So uh, let, let's start. Uh, Brandon uh, from the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, we're, we're so grateful to have you here to talk to us today. Uh, please uh, say a few words about yourself. Sure, Stan. Thank you so much. Really happy to be here. Um, uh, Brandon Wales, I'm the executive director here at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Inf Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, we have an extremely important role when it comes to helping to support the uh, execution of elections here in the United States. And, and that work revolves around um, working with our state and local colleagues uh, to build up their security, to enhance their resilience. Now, we do that across many critical infrastructure sectors, uh, but starting in January 2017, uh, when the election infrastructure sector was designated a part of critical infrastructure by the then Secretary of DHS, um, we have really made it our focus uh, to build up the security and resilience of the election infrastructure across the country. Uh, we do so in a um, in a nonpartisan way, working with secretaries of state, uh, state election directors, local election officials. Um, all of that work is really designed to give them the tools and support that they they need to hold safe and secure elections. Uh, we we do that year round uh, through building up uh, their their knowledge, uh, sharing information, uh, making sure we bring together the entire federal government, uh, all the various capabilities uh, that that um, uh, that exist from our law enforcement. Uh, colleagues from our the intelligence community all making sure that election officials have uh have that support uh we work through the election infrastructure information sharing and analysis center that's run by uh by cis uh, that kathy represents here today um bringing together every single state and territory 3400 local election jurisdictions across the country that are part of that to help us make sure that we are sharing the right information with election officials empowering them to make the right sort of uh, risk management decisions as they face the the complicated uh environment uh that we operate in um and we you know we're only a few weeks out from uh from the election i think it's 40 or 41 days uh, from today. And uh, we are kind of following up with every election official to make sure that they have what they need uh, in the in the last few weeks before the election. And really happy to, to be here today talking about the work that we're doing and frankly, uh, the work that we still have ahead of us. Yeah, super. Brandon, thank you. And not just thank you for being here today, but more, more importantly, really, is, is thank you for all the the work that 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 you and your whole agency is 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 doing uh, on 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 security. Um, uh, next, I want to go to you, Kathy, uh, as well representing the Center for Internet Security, the ISAC uh, that that's there. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself, and again about what Center for Internet Security does, how you fit into this election ecosystem, so to speak. Sure. Thanks so much for having me on, Stan. Uh, thanks, Brandon, for all for all you do and the team does. Uh, so I'm Kathy Bufar, Vice President of Election Operations at Center for Internet Security. And as Brandon mentioned, uh, CIS is also the home of the EII SEC and the MSI SEC. You'll hear a lot of alphabet soup today, and we'll try to translate everything. Uh, but as Brandon said, the EII SEC uh, was created after elections were declared critical infrastructure in early 2017. The EII SEC is a community, much like uh, yours uh, here, Stan, that you're talking about. We are a community of election officials across the country, uh, over 3,400 currently growing every week. Um, and this is a mix of local and state election officials and the technology and security personnel who work with them to make sure that our elections are secure. Um, so we work very closely with Brandon and his teams at CISA and are federally funded large for most of our work. Um, and prior to being in this position, I was actually on the stakeholder side of things as Pennsylvania Secretary of State. So as Secretary of State, CISA and CIS were actually key partners to us to make sure that we could provide the highest level of security to our, our constituents across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and beyond. And while I was Pennsylvania Secretary of State, I also served uh, from 2019 to 2020 as co-chair of the elections subcommittee of the National Association of Secretaries of State. So we were working with folks across the country. 
um, as well as I was a NAS uh, representative on the EIS GCC, again, did I mention the alphabet soup? Uh, the Election Infrastructure Subsector Government Coordination Council, um, which we also partner with at CIS. Um, and I'll just say, again, getting to the community and the multi-levels that are critical to elections. Um, my first job in elections was actually as a poll worker. So I started out uh, in the in the precincts at the poll poll poll, uh, poll worker level, um, and after that, also became a voting rights attorney for a national civil rights organization. So I've kind of seen the most local to the state and to the federal levels, um, and I have to say I'm incredibly thankful for the cross sector collaboration and partnerships because that's all critical to making sure we can provide the most secure and accessible elections to the voters of this great nation. That's yeah, Kathy. great, that, that's great, Kathy. It's interesting, until we met, uh, I only knew Center for Internet Security as uh, the the controls and the, the technology stuff, I mean, that you guys are, have been great at. Uh, and uh, when Tony Sager, uh, introduced us. Tony's on the, if, if you don't know Tony, he's one of the gurus in this space. Uh, when he introduced us and I got to know you and, and, and your background and all, it was just, it added a whole new dimension that I had never seen at, at, at the center uh, and and a well-needed and, and well-deserved one. We're going to get into the uh, uh, the Albert tool a little bit later as as well as a, a contribution of, of of the center uh adam that that brings us to you and again you're you're a whole different piece of this ecosystem as, as well as we're trying to wrap our heads around you know how do we what is this beast and how do we help make sure that it's secure uh with your work at usc and and the center there so again please say a few words about yourself and about the work that that, that you do at the center uh, well, the uh, uh, our work in this area, credit where credit's due, is because of Vince Cerf, uh, one of the inventors, some say the inventor of the internet, who in 2015 suggested that we focus on cybersecurity and securing everything connected to the internet, the internet of things. Um, and uh, USC's president uh, at the time, Max Nikias, um, when I told him about that suggestion, he said that I was thinking too narrowly that in addition to my appointments, I've had engineering and communications in my appointments at USC, that it should also be public policy, business, law, political science, and keep going because it really touches everybody. Um, so that was 2015. So in 2016, when the Democratic National Committee email pack took place, uh, we had a team already in place looking at cybersecurity, representing all of those, uh, all of those uh, uh, schools uh, at USC. And the National Governor Association approached us and said, you know, the federal government has lots of money and lots of people, and we don't. <laughs> so would you be our uh, cybersecurity uh, election research partner? So we pivoted to elections, and uh, uh, we did uh, programs, uh, some public, some uh, off the record, at uh, NGA summer and winter meetings. Uh, we went out into the state, starting in Richmond, Virginia, uh, went to St. Paul, Minnesota, and some other state capitals, doing uh, closed door um, uh, meetings, uh, training for election officials. And then in 2019, Google approached us and said, uh, wouldn't you like to do all 50 states? And I said, well, you know, I used to be in charge of political coverage at CBS News, and that's a multi-million dollar project, and we don't have time to get through your bureaucracy or ours. Um, and it turned out they already had the money appropriated to do it. And mm -hmm. so uh, we uh, quickly uh, staffed up and uh, we were, our plan was to go to physically go to each of the 50 states in 2020. And we did six before COVID hit and we did the other 44 one by one uh, virtually. Um, and uh, thanks to CISA, Matt Masterson in 2020 and Kim Wyman this year, uh, been extraordinarily helpful. Uh, uh, and, and our our unique niche, as far as we know, we don't know anybody else doing this, is to go out to each of the states. We've hit each state three times now, uh, working with secretaries of state around the country at NAS, working with election directors, and we've had people ranging from uh, um, uh, senators, uh, governors, uh, um, others who uh, uh, have been our keynote speakers in the uh, uh, in the sessions we've done. 
And uh, in fact, on our website, you can see hundreds of videos of people who have uh, taken part in our sessions. So uh, that's our uh, uh, that's our niche. That's uh, where we plan to keep going in 2023 and uh, and in the 24 cycle. Um, and uh, uh, we're all at electionsecurity.usc.edu. That's great, Adam. Uh, thank you. you know, I, and again, for all of you, I mean, Kathy and Brandon and all, I, thanks not just for the webinar, but for the work. That, that, that's the most important piece of it. Uh, next thing I want to do is, is, is play a video from the California Secretary of State, a little short video. She's not able to be here, but she did want to describe uh, some of the work that they're doing in, in, in California. Hello, I'm Dr. Shirley Weber, California Secretary of State. And as Secretary of State, I have many roles, but one of my main roles is being California's Chief Election Officer. So I want to thank everyone here today for joining this important conversation on election cybersecurity. In California, we take election cybersecurity very seriously. And because elections are run at the county level, it is the duty of the Secretary of State to take a holistic approach to election cybersecurity. For example, in California, if a county wants a new voting system, it must receive certification and undergo months of rigorous state testing. This means including functional testing, source code review, red team security testing, and accessibility and volume testing. We also require that every ballot must either be paper or have a voter verifiable paper audit trail. Our office continually updates and expands cyber attack prevention capabilities and our infrastructure security measures are comprehensive and multi-layered. My office monitors misinformation and disinformation trends, and we counter those false narratives with our own content that we share with our partners. Our post provides accurate information and ensure voters know that state and local elected officials are trusted sources of election information. The California Secretary of State's office works around the clock to make sure your vote is safe and secure. Today's conference is a great gathering, and I wish I could be there in person to take back some of the great information being shared. But we must understand that the goal of mis- and disinformation is to diminish trust in our elections and prevent citizens from voting. So you be sure to vote and know that your vote will count when you vote this coming November. Thank you very much for hearing me, and I look forward to a wonderful conference and the information. That was nice. It was a good setup to what we'll be talking about today because the you know with with the with the introductions over so to speak we're going to look at basically three things what's what's the whole environment the the ecosystem the infrastructure what's that election look like uh, the infrastructure then we're going to look on look at uh cyber and physical risks that we have i mean elections are not risk-free they have never been risk-free probably back to the election in 1788 uh then and and then we're going to take on the, the the task of misinformation and disinformation. So kind of think through those three things: what's the election system environment, the infrastructure, and all? What are the risks and threats uh, to it? Uh, how are those being managed? And then what about misinformation and disinformation, and how might we we manage that? So with that, jumping right into the kind of the the infrastructure piece of it, uh, Brian. Uh, let, let, let's see. Let let's start there with with you, Adam. Uh, on on that because you you you're the one you you see the whole elections from the side from the USC side as opposed to being a player in in that system so kind of take us through how that looks like from you from from your perspective well what we've seen uh is that the 50 states are very very different uh, and uh, uh and within each state as you know, you have different election systems and different um, uh, methods of uh, where and how to vote. Uh, and sometimes it'll change within a county. So uh, there are certain things that are common around uh, around the country and certain things that are not. I mean, you, New Hampshire is total paper. Their, their secretary of state, former secretary of state had a, had a slogan. He said, you can't hack a pencil. Uh, so uh, <laughs> they're very happy being totally on paper. Uh, but uh, it, as you go through the rest of the country, uh, they're using different types of uh, machines, different types of voter rolls, different types of uh, uh, hardware and software. And so uh, what we have tried to do is to address uh, commonalities. And this was at the suggestion of people who have actually run campaigns, even at the presidential level, uh, presidential, state and local campaigns. 
Um, we had a meeting with Mike Murphy, who ran uh, Jeb Bush's campaign in 2016, and Bob Shrum, who uh, ran the John Kerry campaign in 2004. And they both said, start with the basics, start with passwords. And I said, oh, come on, guys. You know, they said, no, no, start with passwords. Well, we're discovering that uh, uh, that an awful lot of people in our workshops, uh, uh, including people in some pretty interesting political and uh, 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 official positions, do change their passwords. Uh, and we, so we do that quickly. We go to uh, 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 multi-factor authentication. Again, a lot of people start implementing it. Maybe they had to uh, to use their online banking, but they hadn't done it yet in their uh, political campaigns. So we focus on commonalities and then try uh, to the extent that there are, and there always are differences, we try to bring in local officials who can, uh, uh, who can be the sources of uh, good information, particularly secretaries of state. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very interesting on, on, on that. Uh, and I find it just, you know, having to talk about passwords and multi-factor authentication and, and the kinds of, of, of defensive controls as, as a critical piece of it, I, I think we may all have a sense that those things, we can take those things for granted. But in fact, the reality is that sadly, you know, as, as as we find every time there's a breach, uh, we 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 can't. Brandon, uh, let me turn it over to you and ask the same kind of question. You know, what what's this infrastructure look like from from CIS's perspective? What is it that that you see as the main things you've got to be managing here along this the, the, these dimensions? Yeah, yeah, that's a it's a it's an important question because we we as noted earlier, you know, elections are largely run at the local level. Um, and many of the decisions about how elections are administered are made by local officials. Uh, and what that means is that we have an incredibly diverse election infrastructure uh, that, has already been pointed out, is going to differ from location to location, sometimes from precinct to precinct. Um, and that diversity has certain strengths. It makes it very hard for potential uh, adversaries to exploit our vulnerabilities at scale. Uh, but it also means we have to do a lot of work to make sure that that election infrastructure can be secured uh, across these various systems with a lot of different players involved from uh, the federal government providing support, the state government providing oversight and guidance uh, from the secretaries of state and other chief election officials down to local uh, election officials who are actually uh, the ones making things happen. And inside of that, there is this diverse technology ecosystem that underpins it, whether it's voter registration systems, uh, electronic or paper poll books, uh, the ballot preparation process and programming, particularly for, for electronic uh, machines that have electronic machines behind them, uh, the actual voting machines themselves, systems that are used to tabulate and aggregate votes, the websites that are used to provide uh, election night reporting, uh, down to the more physical infrastructure besides the machines, like these the storage facilities where these things are kept, the polling places, the election offices where this work happens. And so a lot of the work that we do is looking across this ecosystem, trying to identify kind of those key places, the unique vulnerabilities that exist there so that we can target our uh, risk management support in the places that matter most. And that has really driven a lot of our activity over the last several years understanding what are the points that adversaries are most likely to exploit. Um, in a lot of cases, those are the things that are most likely to be internet enabled, um, like voter registration systems or uh, the uh, unofficial election night reporting, um, and to provide uh, kind of guidance on how to make sure that those systems are particularly hardened, uh, even though those are not necessarily ones that are directly tied to, to counting um, or certifying uh, the vote in any, any particular area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, again, I've, what I'm hearing is a, just a ton of complexity and lots of everybody does it differently. And yet at the end of the day, everybody's, you know, gives numbers and that that's what gets out to the public. You know, this candidate got this many votes, that candidate got this many votes, uh, but it's all everybody's doing it their own way, but in a controlled way, which I guess, Kathy, takes us to you, because with the ISAC, you know, because now you're not just looking at how everybody's doing it differently, but how do you share information and how do you help each other along these venues, if you will, these avenues, if if you will, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, and I, everything that Brandon and Adam just said, um, is so true, and I'll say, you know, but to to just first get to 
really what it means when we talk about elections run at the local levels. You know, I think we can't be reinforcing enough um, that when we say elections are run at the local level, what we mean is the people who are literally direct, like our election directors at our county level, they are our neighbors. They are the people who are out on the soccer field coaching our kids. They are, you know, on our PTAs. I don't, I don't know if they call them PTAs. I'm probably mm -hmm. showing my age. Um, but you know, they are, they are, they are out there. They are genuinely the heroes of our democracy who work harder than almost anybody I know to to make sure that every one of us can exercise our fundamental right to vote. So I just want to be clear. This is this is what our elections are made of, and. You know, you were you were talking about um, the complexity of it, and I think you know, I, I think a lot of times people get focused on one piece of the of the ecosystem of the puzzle. Um, and the truth is, I think it was Brandon, maybe a combination of Brandon and Adam, who were talking about the different the different parts of the processes. Um, we have to think of election security like we think of national security. We can have the strongest air force in the world. But if our, you know, our land and sea defenses and offensives are not ready to go, the strongest air force in the world is not going to protect us. We need to do the same thing on election security. And this is why the people are so critical at every level. So even though elections are run at the local level, um, it's the cross-sector partnerships, local, state, and federal, that make our election systems as strong as they are. And oftentimes I talk about vertical and horizontal uh, cross-sector collaboration. So horizontally, we're talking about, you know, for example, in Pennsylvania, when I was Secretary of State, we created the an interagency election security and preparedness work group. And basically at the state level, we broke down silos and we brought together, you know, our Office of Homeland Security at the federal and state and state level. We had, of course, the Department of State. We had the Office of Information Technology and our state CISO. We had the Pennsylvania State Police. We had the National Guard. We had the you know, Department of uh, Veterans and Military Affairs and lots of other folks. So basically folks who had been working uh, separately on issues touching the security of our elections but had never worked together. But we, we created this strong collaborative working group that just made the entire Commonwealth stronger as a result. And vertically, we did a similar effort from the local to the state to the federal levels. And so this gets some to stand what you were asking about the EII SEC and information sharing. So that's really a critical piece of this puzzle. So for example, you know, in 2018 on election day, um, we had both a uh, federal, so the EII SAC runs in partnership with CISA uh, and election mm -hmm. day and, you know, beyond election day, but it's certainly on election day, a situation room where we have a platform where folks across the country can be connected to make sure that we're sharing information. And then in Pennsylvania, we also had a state version of that. And what happened, for example, in 2018 is there was some some state reported some IP addresses that were uh, in that were they saw as uh, making attempt to access information. They shared that in the federal situation room so that states across the country could proactively block those IP addresses. And then we in turn shared that on our state platform so that counties across the Commonwealth could proactively block. That's the power of information sharing right there. One state in one place sharing that information made literally the entire country stronger. So that's an example of what we do at the EII SEC and the critical roles that we play, all of us at the federal, state, and local level to make our elections stronger. Mm -hmm. Somehow it's I'm 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 hearing. Uh, and of course, it's 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 part of the very fundamental piece of, of secure the village that it takes a village to secure the village. It's it's getting everybody in 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 involved in in all of those things. So, uh, while we're kind of on 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 this subject, uh, just we've got registration systems. I'm going to just follow up with with, with just one one question. Uh, you know, looking just at the registration systems, they're implemented differently across the country in different states. How do we 
how do we make sure that there's a consistency of okay every state's doing it differently but you're getting the same results if somebody goes to register to vote they're in fact registered to vote uh anybody want to tackle that what, what you're seeing No one, Adam. I let me, let me look at you because you you go out and talk to the states. So, yeah, uh, I uh, I think that there are things that uh, the Election Assistance Commission has actually taken uh, some leadership on uh, on some of the aspects of what you're just, what you're describing, and uh, you can go to eac.gov is their website, uh, but also they uh, work directly with states. Even uh, the Tom Thomas Hicks, the uh, executive director, um, he should be a pretty popular guy because he has money to give to the states uh, to implement some of these things. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yes, when you get down to uh, those kinds of procedural and mechanical uh, issues, that uh, EAC is a uh, is is a good resource. Mm -hmm. Good to hear, I mean, because. And, and and again, I mean, it, 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 it in some ways goes to the strengths of democracy. I mean, the way the, the way we're we're set up that every organization gets to you know think through it in 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 their own ways. But then there have to be overriding principles around at at the same time how how you do those things. Okay, um, we're going to take a, a a little break here uh, before we come back and 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 begin to look at the risks and threats and mitigation and and, and that whole piece of it. And this is an opportunity to thank people. Uh, first, thanking uh, some partners of ours that have helped spread the word. I believe the fact that there are as many participants on this call as there are uh, speaks to their support and 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 their help. Uh, the in California here, the California Lawyers Association has been a, a very good friend of of Secure the Village, uh, particularly their privacy group and their cybersecurity groups as as well. Uh, the IEEE, their Orange County Computer Society, as as well, good friends of ours, and they help spread the word not just to their own computer society but to IEEE societies across the country as as well. And and then another organization with a very long name innovation for the benefit of humanity but it's a great group of people that truly wants to see us take all the innovations that we're doing with cyber uh and and apply them to how does it help humanity uh as contrasted to oh how do we make money on it for example uh and then uh our sponsor uh uh, platinum sponsor Miller Kaplan as 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 well. Um, Napoleon said something to the effect that an army marches on its stomach, and a nonprofit marches uh, through the graciousness of, of of its sponsors. And and Miller Kaplan has been a, a truly a, a great sponsor of ours. Uh, Miller Kaplan, if if you don't know, they're a top one hundred U.S. certified public accounting firm. Uh, they're even older than I am. Uh, they were established in 1941, uh, and they do audit and accounting and tax and business management, of course, information security, licensing royalties work, uh, industry metrics, consulting services, and so on, uh, to businesses, fiduciaries, and 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 tax-exempt organizations uh, uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, Miller Kaplan bought our information security management firm, Citadel Information Group, back in 2020. And David Lamb, whom I'm about to introduce, was one of our partners at Citadel and is now uh, a partner at, at, at uh, Miller Kaplan. Uh, one of the things you saw on the video just before I introduce you, David, was the one screen that basically said, protect we have a duty to protect our information uh, the way we want other to protect others' information the way we want them to protect ours. That came from work that David and I and our third partner, Kimberly Pease, did uh, when David was the uh, CIO, a chief information officer, chief information security officer of Stephen S. Wise Temple and, and schools. Uh, and we found that as very basic and fundamental, this idea of a golden rule of, of information security. And I've, I've always been grateful to, to David for kind of helping bring that piece out. David, say a few words and and, and thank you so much for both your friendship and 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 your, your support of, of Secure the Village. Well, Stan, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor 
just just to to participate and to see see secure the village thriving it's such important work that you do and Brandon, Kathy, and Adam, it's so important for what you do to help our country and our democracy and for spreading the word. The more awareness we have, the better. Um, and, and so, you know, we're very proud to sponsor Secure the Village and the phenomenal work that's being done in helping people secure their infrastructure. It's something that Stan and I and, and Kim Pease on our team and the entire rest of our team are very passionate about. Um, we're always excited to help people improve their information security and to participate in events like this. So thank you, Stan, for having us. Super. Th those are the win, 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 win opportunities to, to me that, you know, every everybody wins. Society itself wins. And and that makes us all better, all more powerful and, and, and stronger that way. Um, Okay, so so let's go on. I mean, you know, so we got this ecosystem. And it's very distributed and it's very complex, et cetera, et, et cetera. Uh, to say that it's threatened, uh, that there are risks to it, and so on, uh, is is a gross understatement. Kathy, your your example of these malicious IP addresses that were discovered and and once discovered can be shared with everybody else. You know. Uh, What's the, you know, as, as as we jump into the election, I mean, we're, we're just a few weeks away now, you know, uh, two questions seem to me to be uppermost in, in, in mind. I'm going to throw them both out and let you both talk about them in, in kind of how you see it. Uh, first, what's the cyber threat landscape look like from what you're seeing? And second, you know, Kathy, you mentioned the election workers. I mean, you really brought it home that we're talking, these are, these are our neighbors who are sitting in poll booths and, you know, they're processing us if we've not voted by mail or they're doing the ballots if we have voted by mail or whatever. And and certainly, sadly, what we've seen is is physical uh, abuse and attacks as well. So uh, on, on both of those subjects, what what's the threat landscape? physical and cyber look like and what you know, how do we how do we manage that? Uh, and, and again, Kathy, let, let's start with you with the uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the ISAC. Sure. Um, so, you know, again, as I was talking about the 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 different um, the way of looking at this as, you know, like we look at national security where we have to be uh, paying attention on all fronts, that's you know, it, it it obviously makes our job much harder um, and makes our election officials' jobs harder because uh, not only do they have to be thinking about the, you know, the bread and butter of election administration, but of course, cy the cyber uh, atmosphere environment has exploded over the last, you know, four or five years. And then in the last couple of years, unfortunately, as you mentioned, the physical security piece has become uh, much more significant. And so so we we've been trying to support election officials on all fronts. Um, so the you know one of the things that we've heard again and again from you know from election officials is, you know, of course, it's been, you know, for years, we have to worry every day about efforts to um, influence our elections through cyber attacks and whatnot. And so the, the election officials are getting better and better at it. but, it, you know, as as you've probably heard before, this is a, you know it's it's a race without a finish line, right? We have to be mm -hmm. building our defenses uh, str more quickly than those that are trying to tear them down. And election officials are genu gen generally not technology experts, right? Including myself. So, you know, we have to be talking about it in ways that they can understand, or at least in ways that they know what questions to ask their IT and security professionals. So one of the things we've been doing at the EII SAC and CIS is really trying to translate uh, technology advice into layperson speak and go go to the people where they are, right? And so, for example, in you know, in order for them to build a, a defense in depth, uh, you know, environment, they need to understand what each of those defenses means. Um, so for example, we just recently, several months ago, released what we call the Essential Guide to Election Security. And it's a resource for election officials. And what we did is this was an update to um, a resource that we 
that we published in 2018, which was then called the Handbook for Election Security. And the Essential Guide is now online. And what we did was we created three separate layers of, um, of advanced, of, of understanding and um, uh, advancedness. That's not a word, but uh, for <laughs> election officials, right? So we want to make sure that like the most advanced state learns something from it and the tiniest, most rural county with no IT staff also can learn. So somebody was talking about this earlier, right? The you know, as simple as passwords and multi-factor authentication. If you go on to the Essential Guide for Election Security, you'll find level one advice, level two advice, and level three advice. And um, and I encourage everybody to go there um, because you really can learn, even though it's directed at election officials, everybody can learn from it. All, all government and other uh, agencies can learn from it. And to your Point about the physical component, and then I'll I'll, I'll stop. Um, we also have a page on there that is new, that you know wasn't something that we were thinking about in 2018 when we released the handbook, which is addressing physical threats um, and physical security. And what we so you find in addressing physical security page, we have on there some general guidance for election officials, as well as links to partners who have resources, including CISA has some great uh, resources on this. And we're also going to be putting on a webinar in a couple of weeks where we're going to have CISA and other folks present guidance. There's a there's an organization I encourage folks to check out called the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, which is a collaboration of law enforcement, election official, law enforcement officials, election officials, and federal agencies and other partners. There's a ton of great resources, including guidance on steps to take to make sure that we're connecting back to the cross-sector collaboration, that we need to be connecting law enforcement and election officials at the local level to make sure that we can have confidence in the security on the ground, as well as the security you know, through the web. So I'll stop there. There's a million different ways, directions <laughs> we could go in. Well, and it, it's, it's, you know, I, I'm the outsider, if you will, listening to, to this and, you know, I find it so fascinating the all the work that, that's going on. I mean, it's not unexpected, of course. I mean, I I, I would expect, uh, you know, as as an all citizen, let's say, that it would it would somewhat look like this. Um, I'm also finding it like what you what you said, and and it is so true. Uh, th this idea that we we've got to take the the language that we're used to using which is very you know it's about bits and bytes and ip you know like what's an ip address i mean it's it's obvious to some of us others it's it's not and it, it goes brandon to what jen easterly at CISA talks about as 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 well uh this whole idea of getting rid of the the the, the geek speak of of learning how to talk cybersecurity in a language that people who are not as technically proficient as as we might be can, can also understand uh so i thought that was a very important piece kathy that that that, that you brought up again brandon uh from sis's perspective what's what what's this all look like yeah i mean you, you i would think you would see those threats from a top-down perspective uh differently from so, the side perspective yeah go ahead yeah no that's um I would say that you know we see things from from multiple perspectives because we want to meet our partners uh, where they are. So obviously we do a lot of work uh, trying to understand what the threat environment looks like, working with the U.S. intelligence community and law enforcement communities to understand uh, how that threat environment has shifted and evolved over time. Uh, but we also are working every day with election officials across the country. We hear from them the issues. Uh, that they're confronting, the threats that they're seeing, the threats that they're experiencing, um, and the places where they need additional support and help. And so I think that this community has evolved tremendously uh, over the past uh, six years from where we were in 2016 to where we are today, where there was a true partnership between the government, um, uh, the federal government and uh, state and local governments when it comes to the election security mission um, from initially being very uh, leery, uh, generously leery of working with the federal government on elections issues uh, to the point today where there is a strong hunger 
uh, for more support mm -hmm. um, addressing the threats that they're that they're now experiencing. I think that there was a tremendous amount of work uh, between 2016 and 2020 on building up the cyber capacity of our election infrastructure because that's where we saw um, the most significant potential risks. It was an area that had been um, somewhat unaddressed uh, as we moved towards more electronic voting uh, post Help America Vote Act passage, um, and it was we were we needed to kind of catch up and help the election officials. Be be more prepared, be ready, um, and have basic levels of cyber hygiene across across the systems. Uh, you know, those cyber threats still exist. Cyber is obviously still a very easy tool that adversaries, whether they're nation states or criminal organizations or hack hacktivists, could use to potentially exploit our systems. Um, but obviously, as we see every day, uh, that that threat environment has has evolved. Um, election officials are dealing with physical threats and doxing and um, um, uh, threats to their individual persons that didn't really exist uh, in in 2016 and 2020, um, and we are now having to, to to change and adapt and increase the amount of support that were provided there. A lot of that work is done in close partnership with the Department of Justice and the FBI, uh, who have a you know a task force set up to focus on threats to election workers. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but we're also trying to provide more information to election officials about how they can think about the physical security of their locations, um, how they can be better prepared for uh, events like doxing. Uh, we're providing materials. We're doing some training on how they can de-escalate, uh, provide de-escalation training for their individuals who may deal with um, um, uh, threatening uh, individuals who come into their uh, polling places or into into election offices. Uh, that's important work to respond uh, to the types of threats that election officials are are really concerned about uh, concerned about today. I think that builds upon uh, this idea that election officials are born risk managers. Uh, they've got to manage a variety of risks to ensure that they have uh, safe and reliable elections. Uh, these security concerns they have today are new ones. They're ones where they need additional support and assistance. And you know we hope over time uh, that we are building our capacity capacity to give them uh, to give them what they need. I think we've demonstrated what we can do when we put our focus around it when it comes to some of these cyber uh, threats that they experienced post 2016. Um, and I think now the federal government um, uh, working with local law enforcement needs to do the same uh, for the physical threats to election officials that they're grappling with today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's something that's again, I find heartening that uh, Justice Department, FBI, and so on, are participants in the protection that, that that has to has to happen, um, Adam. That same thing. I mean, Brandon mentioned a hunger for information, uh, and certainly, I think in some of our states and localities, there's that hunger. Uh, also, from what I've read, I think there's also a, a, a resistance to some of the information among uh, some of our our, our, our counties, so to speak. But on on you know how how do you see it coming in? Uh, and 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 talking to the various states and and counties and, and localities as well, you know, because you you get down as as well down at at ground level. Uh, what are people most concerned about, and, and and what do they what do they look to you for guidance? Well, I think that there are two areas: uh, you, the things that are expected and the things that are unexpected. The things that are expected <laughs> right now are. Uh, I love uh, Minnesota uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon said, you know, we see adversaries trying the doorknobs all the time, trying to figure out how to get in. Uh, and he said, as far as we know so far, they, they haven't been successful. We see them trying all the time. So that's your basic cyber hygiene, your basic barriers. But every now and then there is uh, uh, the unexpected. I mean, Russia has people sitting in uh, St. Petersburg, China has people who are actually conducting R&D on how best to disrupt American elections. And I'll just give you one example of something which really hadn't occurred to a lot of people, uh, but fortunately, uh, Homeland Security had occurred to them. Uh, the, the Associated Press has been our national uh, media partner and uh, their uh, longtime president, uh, Gary Pruitt, was on our advisory board. And uh, so after the 2020 election, I said, you know, what, what keeps you up at night? He said, I'll tell you what kept me up at night on election night. Uh, that on a, He said, fortunately, before election day, we were notified by uh, the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security that the Associated Press was a priority target for Russia uh, on election day 2020. 
And he said, and so we were prepared layers and layers and layers of uh, redundancy and, and protection. Um, and we were on the phone constantly with Homeland Security. And what happened on election day, 2020, this is, it's not classified, it's not secret. In fact, uh, Gary discussed it in a couple of our workshops. Russia staged thousands of massive, sophisticated attacks on the Associated Press, election day and election night. Uh, so uh, when Gary was discussing this in, in uh, our first workshop in 2021, I said, please explain to everybody, why would Russia go after the Associated Press? And he said, very simple. If they had taken down our computer system, he would have had no election returns that night. Oh, <laughs> he said, Russia knew this somehow. And they targeted us. So he, he said attacks also came from Pakistan and some other countries, but they were led by Russia. And he said, just think of what would happen to faith in democracy around the United States if you turn on your television set or go to your computer or turn on your radio. And uh, yes, we had an election today, but unfortunately, we can't tell you any of the winners or losers. He said, now also think the Associated Press also has clients like the BBC in London and HK in Japan. So they go on the air and they go on their websites and say, there was a major election in the United States, but we won't know who's won until the states certify the results in another week or two. And again, think of what that would do to faith and democracy around the world, looking at America. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and so that raises another important subject, uh, which, which will kind of two, two subjects even as, as it goes on the one hand, it's we see attacks coming in advance, and so we're able to do some measure of blocking them. I mean, the the Associated Press story is exactly that. Uh, so I want to stay there for just a moment and then look at the other side of it, which is Russia and China and our enemies and not just uh, hacking attacks, so to speak, but also misinformation and disinformation. But first on the, you know, when we see these threats coming and th these attacks coming uh, is is a, a, a perfect segue to something the Center for Internet Security has built. And I've, I've had a chance to kind of read about it and all uh, the Albert sensor. And it's it's like, oh, my God, if every business could have a little Albert sensor that it plugged into, uh, we could get eliminate so much cyber crime. And yet, at the same time, we have some counties that refuse to use it. And Kathy, I want to ask you to, because you, you represent CIS, if you will, to say, say a little bit about the Albert Sensor and uh, how we really need to be thinking about this. Yeah, I mean, and this intersects with, um, you know, of course, the this and disinformation uh, piece of this discussion. Um, so the Albert, so let me first explain just in simple terms. I mean, the Albert sensor is an intrusion detection system. And, you know, it's not the only uh, intrusion detection system. These exist. And the name is is really right on. It is to detect attempts to intrude into your network. And so it sits on the network and it sends an alert when there's when there's a what it perceives as a threat coming in. And it, it's known, known cyber threat. So basically each one that comes in, kind of like when I was talking about the 20 IP addresses that were identified, each then identified threat gets added to a library. And because Albert sensors were created specifically for state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, um, we, I, I think we might have the largest uh, library of identified malicious threats because of the information sharing, again, which strengthens all of us. It strengthens, strengthens us individually, and it strengthens us broad, broadly. Let me tell you what the Albert Center is not and what it does not do. It does not go into your network. It does not read the content of encrypted traffic. It doesn't reach into your network and make changes. None of those things. It literally is there to identify if an incoming threat is, is, is happening and it sends notifications to the people that you designate, that your, des that your jurisdiction designates to then remediate anything that's needed. Um, and CIS um, and the MSVIISAC, we have a 24 seven uh, security operations center. So we've got uh, you know, experts around the clock who are there so for example, let's say it's Christmas Eve and you know 11 p.m. on Christmas Eve and everybody's home with their family 
Um, and the one person that's, you know, on, on call at the, you know, pick a government agency, any government agency, um, they, they see that something came in that they're worried about, or they even clicked on a link and then realized, uh-oh, they can call us at literally any hour of any day or night, find out, was this malicious? You know, was this, you know, is this something that I need to worry about? And the CIS 24 seven SOC will walk them through the now will do the analysis and walk them through any remediation necessary. So all this to say, and the Albert sensors block, you know, do the block, do the, they don't block, they, they notify. I want to just mm -hmm. quickly throw in a, uh, add uh, on top of the intrusion detection system that the Albert sensor is, there's also other federally funded protections that we offer to, to it's particularly free to, lo to local and state election officials, which are blocking tools. So we've got endpoint detection and response tools, which go around every computer endpoint. We've got uh, MDBR, which is the malicious domain um, BR, uh, blocking and reporting. Uh, which mm -hmm. go around a network. So these are, again, talking earlier about the layers of defense. There are lots of these available to state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. And connecting to the mis- and disinformation piece of this, and I think Stan, you or Adam or Brandon said this earlier, the, the sad um, consequence of the mis- and disinformation about Albert sensors and anything else, when a county decides to unplug because they choose to believe mis- or disinformation rather than the reality of, of these layered defenses, um, they're helping those overseas adversaries, right? They're doing the job for mm -hmm. them, basically, um, by unplugging and then making not only them more vulnerable, but by the nature of how we're all connected, all of us uh, more vulnerable. So, you know, it's it's really brings home why we need to be doing a better job at distribute distributing accurate information, distributing it to those who need it most. Um, and this is sort of a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's so true. Thanks, thanks, Kathy, for for that insight. And all. we're going to switch to the whole subject of misinformation and disinformation in a minute. But before we do, I want to take another break, uh, give our uh, audience just a chance to catch their breath for a second. And I want to call out some other organizations. Uh, I mean, as, 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 as you saw, we're, we're a nonprofit in the cybersecurity in you know space, but we're not alone. Uh, there's an organization, nonprofit cyber. It's a collaborative of about thirty plus of us, all nonprofits, all uh, involved in. How do we help? How do we help the community? How do we help our villages get more secure, both in the business side and at the uh, at, at, at the individual user side? Uh, uh, Kathy, your Center for Internet Security, one of the founders of, of nonprofit cyber and along with the Global Cyber Alliance, and, and we're, 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 we're fortunate to be a member of it. Uh, there's also the Cyber Crime Support Network that is just does so much work, both to help victims of cyber crime, both often small businesses and individuals, but also to begin to build an infrastructure of just understanding cybercrime in a, a deeper way, having a standards way of, you know, of, of, of identifying uh, crimes and, and so on. Uh, the Cyber Readiness Institute as, as well, great work with their cyber leader program uh, and all. Uh, the National Cybersecurity Alliance, which is part of the Stop Think Connect program, uh, also uh, very valuable in this space and, and sightline security, another nonprofit. They're a, a nonprofit that helps nonprofits on, on cybersecurity, which I find so, so wonderful because as we all know, our, our, our nonprofits, uh, have so much on their plate to do and every dollar you take away from their mission is a dollar they can't apply to helping the causes that that they care about. So I, I'd like everybody to be aware that there's a lot of groups out there, and and uh, you know if 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 you're of a kind to support 
nonprofits. Think about supporting the cybersecurity nonprofits around you as 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 well. Uh, with that, let, let's turn to our, 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 our final section of, of today's webinar, the whole subject of misinformation, disinformation. And of course, yesterday at, uh, on, on the news, we saw another illustration of it when uh, Meta blocked attacks coming from both Russia and China, uh, disinformation attacks on 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 social media, on, on specifically on on the the meta uh, work. Brandon, we're going to start with you there on on kind of you know what's what's going on here and how how do we help this? How do we help ordinary people? You know who don't have the time or you know the energy to pay deep attention to this stuff. I mean, you live at twenty four by seven. I live cybersecurity kind of the same way, uh, but only, you know, a tiny piece of it in the election. But then there are other people that, you know, they just they don't have time, but they need to know what's going on here. And how do, how do we help them? No, Stan, that, that's it, that's exactly the right question, which is, you know, we are we're living in an extremely turbulent information environment uh, where uh, foreign actors, domestic actors um, are flooding the information space with disinformation, misinformation. Um, and it is hard to cut through the noise. I mean, CISA has worked hard uh, since 2016 to try to build resilience against foreign malign uh, influence operations. Um, and frankly, uh, what we have seen and what we have learned is that the most impactful way of combating disinformation is really, you know, in the election space is to empower local election officials as the trusted voice. Uh, within those communities. As Kathy said at the beginning, uh, local election officials are your neighbors, are your friends, um, and you want uh, to hear from those people about what is the most accurate information possible about kind of key issues associated with how elections are run uh, in the jurisdiction that you live, um, the steps they take to make sure that it is safe and reliable. Um, and it is our job here at the, at the federal level to support them, to push people uh, to um, uh, to listen to the, that these are the officials you need to get your information from and provide them the resources they need to get that message out. Um, so, for example, uh, CISA, which stood up our rumor versus reality uh, election security webpage in uh, just advance, just in the advance of the 2020 election, um, which we use to kind of counter broad false narratives when it comes to election related issues. Um, you know, we are going through a process of updating the information on that page when we become aware of it, but we're also looking to how do we push more people uh, to the um, uh, rumor versus reality pages that state and local election officials have stood up themselves to make sure that accurate information can get out there that is most applicable to the people inside of those jurisdictions. We can talk at a high level about the broad steps that are taken across this country to ensure safe and secure elections, uh, but there's a lot more tangible information that they're going to get uh, from their local uh, from their local officials. And we want to make sure that we are, again, empowering them. We know at least 13 states that have stood up their own election security rumor versus reality webpage. Uh, many other states have other forms by which they're distributing uh, good quality, high uh, high quality information on elections in their jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, in the next six weeks ahead of the, the midterm election, we want to make sure we're continuing to help the American people understand where they need to go uh, for accurate information um, and with with the humility that the federal government is not always the trusted voice, but let's get them to those trusted voices within their uh, within their community. We are, we are a proud partner of the hashtag uh, Trusted Info 2022 campaign that seeks to steer steer you know steer the American people uh, to those local officials that have the information. Uh, but we're providing other support, things like um, a guide for uh, how to plan for and respond to mis and disinformation incidents uh, for election officials that helps them prepare and recognize uh, what may be misinformation and things that they can do uh, to, to respond at the at the local level. Um, you know, and what we've continued to preach is that the more transparency you have at that state and local level, uh, the more that people uh, will will understand um, and hopefully be swayed uh, by the accurate information that 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 is getting into the into the ecosystem. But you know we shouldn't um, uh, have any rose-colored glasses here. Uh, this is a challenging problem. Uh, there is a lot of disinformation out there, uh, and it is going to take uh, take the village to to really have an impact here. Mm -hmm. Good. Towards towards that end, uh, for you and, and and also Kathy and Adam. Uh, if you'd be so kind as to share some of those websites with us, so we've got them, we'll be more than happy to create a page on our website and, and encourage people to, to go to that page to, 
to learn of, about what's what's really going on. I mean, that that would be a uh, something would be very very uh, <laughs> be very desirous of of of, of, of doing uh, as as well. Adam, as as you talk to people around the country in in different counties and all, I mean, look. Let's let's be honest. I mean, some I, I'm in California. I'm in Los Angeles County. All right. Uh, there there's a recognition. Yeah, there are challenges and we're meeting those challenges, but there are not what one would call election deniers inside of, of Los Angeles and other counties. Uh, purple counties. There's a mixture. And I think to what Brandon and, and Kathy, you're both saying uh as well people talking to people to their neighbors helps but then we've got other counties as well that you know i, I just spoke to a cousin of mine who lives i won't say what state or wherever but she's surrounded uh by what we would call election deniers adam as as you're out talking to different counties and all what do you see in terms of the makeup the breakup of 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 those those counties and the sharing of information of what's what is being done, what might be done, and so on, around helping helping get the the truth out uh, at the expense of sounding truthy. Yeah. Well, what we found is that uh, uh, our adversaries, foreign and domestic, have been uh, unfortunately uh, very successful. I mean, there was a, a big story in the uh, that that was published last week about how Russia attacked the uh, the big 2017 women's march right after Trump mm -hmm. was inaugurated, pretending to different people in Russia pretending to be Americans, and they kept trying different different kinds of information, different uh, personas until they found what worked. Uh, and what worked, unfortunately, was uh, uh, misogyny and, and racism. Um, so that, that's going on throughout the country now. That that uh, and we focus on Russia and China because we believe that if you can defend against them, you can probably defend against any bad actor. Uh, but what we're seeing is something which I haven't uh, uh, seen reported very often in uh, national media is is that on the ground in red states, you find that Democrats. Are very suspicious of computer of election computer systems, and so uh, this is a, this is now a bipartisan problem. This this uh, this suspicion has been has been now spread so far that um, uh, this is going to require more effort than I think we ever realized to mm -hmm. uh, to correct. And we're heading into uh, uh, we're only a month away from the the off year elections this year, but in twenty twenty four. Uh, I think this is going to be an area where we really are going to have to pay a lot of attention and devote a lot of time, uh, state by state, county by county, uh, to mm -hmm. uh, try to get the good information out. We we had one person uh, uh, who has been in a couple of our workshops who actually tests election equipment, hardware and software, and he said most of these reports, including some that are in the media, are so far off, are so wrong. He said they, they'll get the, the type of hardware wrong. They'll have software that hasn't been used in years, uh, but yet people will believe it. And so this, this skepticism of our election system is something that we really have to worry about and, uh, and devote some time and effort um, and, and to be proactive. I mean, yes, we'll get you. Uh, we'll get to you our uh, uh, our websites, which we think are uh, some of the best. I'm sure they overlap with what uh, uh, Kathy and Brandon will send as well. But uh, there is this skepticism on the ground that's just that's that's popular. It's going to require some proactive effort, uh, particularly as we go into uh, the presidential year in 24. Mm -hmm. Wow, that and it's. So true, and yet so challenging, if 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 you will. I mean, at the same time, I mean, it would be nice if if the world were simple, you know, and and these challenges weren't were what we're facing. Uh, but then it brings to mind Bobby Kennedy's statement that you know, uh, you know, w w the future is not something that's a given; it's something we struggle for to achieve. And that that's not quite the way he said it, but that's that's basically the the message of it. Uh, and 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 Kathy again. I mean, again from this from the Center for Internet Security's perspective, what you're seeing. I mean, you've got tools as well that help on the disinformation side. Uh, you know, and uh, what does this look like to you? How do you see this piece? 
Well, I'm going to talk about it both from my current head and my former head. Um, yeah. Obviously, they intertwine. Um, you know, I think what's been said by everyone, you know, is critical. What we need to be doing, we talked some about this before we went live here, right? We need to be, we need to be able to, part of what, what, a lot of what makes our election system so strong is the complexity and the layers and a lot of what makes it hard to explain to people is the complexity and the layers. Yeah. So I've been trying to think about ways to, you know, boil down the essence into tweetable segments, right? That's how we have to do this. We have to go to the people where they are. We have to be on the ground and on, you know, TikTok and everywhere else. But we need to be able to explain it in a way that people understand so that that would then build their their beliefs their their faith so so i you know i've been playing with different ways of talking about it and one of the things that i've been doing is thinking about so the the security of our so just to get to the again talking about how do we disseminate accurate information more effectively um you know i've been sort of boiling it down to there's there's three ways that we could really explain how, why our elections are are so strong and it's the people the science and the math the people we've already talked about, right? It's the locals, our neighbors, but it's also the cross-sector collaborations, everything we've already discussed. The science we've also partly discussed here, right? It's the cybersecurity protections that we've talked about, Albert sensors, uh, you know, endpoint detection and response, MDBR, the malicious domain blocking response, all the you know, phishing training, all the cybersecurity, yeah. you know, tabletop exercises. So those are all go to the science as well as the certification requirements by the EAC of every voting system, you know, logic and accuracy testing that has to be done on every voting system for every election. Those are all the science, right? So you've got the people, the science, and then the math, which we haven't gotten to so much. So, you know, elections obviously are all about numbers. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's pretty simple. You add together all the different ballots for one candidate and for another candidate and the candidate with the most ballots wins. But what we don't talk about enough are all the mathematical and statistical um, pieces of election administration, right? So there's reconciliation uh, in polling places that they have to compare the number of ballots to the number of voters. There's same reconciliation of mail ballots. And then audits, right? So um, risk limiting audits, for example, are a good example of, uh, you know, a newer type of math. Uh, well, it's not newer math, but it's newer used in elections. So for example, in Pennsylvania, we have a statutory requirement. Every county in every election needs to do a statistical sample of 2000 ballots or 2% of the ballots after every single election needs to look at the ballots and make sure that they reflect the, you know, what was recorded previously. But on top of that in Pennsylvania, we started piloting risk limiting audits, which looked at the, you know, the state as a whole. And so for example, in 2020, which as we all know was a close presidential election, um, it required a sample size of close to 50,000 ballots statewide uh, that we were asking counties on top of everything else that they were already dealing with in 2020, we asked to, them to do something more, uh, which was we gave them the, you know, this, the uh, random samples of ballots to pull and, and 63 out of 67 counties participated. And it was another way to show that actually the results of that audit of those, you know, 45 or 50,000 ballots uh, mirrored the results of the previously reported outcome. So again, the people, the science and the math, but, but I just gave all the examples and it took much longer than you mm -hmm. could put in a tweet or on a TikTok. So we need to figure out how to do this in a simple way to get the word out. Yeah. Well, well said. As, as I'm listening to all three of you, I'm, I'm, I was reflecting just on the word trust and you all used it. Uh, and it, it's so fundamental. We seem to be living in a time in history when institutional trust is shrinking, uh, just the sad reality or maybe a historical reality of our time. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it sad because it seems to be a normal cycle that humans go through this way. Uh, and always on the way, we hope, to getting to that next better place. Uh, but 
it's clear that trust in all kinds of institutions is less now than it was uh, when I was a boy. Certainly, let's go back to to those days. Uh, Post World War II, there was a unanimity in America. Uh, it was a false unanimity in a way, in that it left out marginal groups that we didn't want to talk about. But at least in that context, we were united. And then over the last certainly 40 years of my life, I've seen that begin to change uh, that way to where trust in institutions is now much less. And I think it just makes the challenge for all of us, and I look specifically at the three of you, because you're so integral into making this happen, you know, make, building the, the trust uh, here for the, for the election. But it really goes to all of us, everybody uh, who's been on this webinar, and all of us as as, as well participating as as, as speakers and, and, and what have you, but uh, to just know what's going on and understand it and and help our neighbor if if you will uh we're coming down to the bottom of the hour or the bottom of the half hour uh so let me just ask each of you just you know final thoughts if you want to send a message out to to people what you know and 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 some of it you've already said but just kind of summarize it and uh kathy since we just left you let me go to adam and then Kathy, and then Brandon to, to wrap it up. So Adam, kind of final thoughts, if you would. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, I think that one thing that I'd like to see, this is not so, this is not a short-term solution. This is a long-term investment. I mean, uh, I'm, uh, Stan, I don't know who, how old you are, but I'm almost 80 years old. So I went to school in the 50s when civics was a big deal. And now I see from my grandchildren, it's less of a big deal. It's, uh, and so... I'm concerned about the lack of information about uh, not just our elections, but about democracy. Um, uh, but uh, to refocus on elections, the election director in New Jersey has a, a, a joke he likes to use opening some of his remarks. He says, uh, uh, his name is uh, uh, Robert Giles. He says, think of election people as uh, Santa Claus. You only see us once a year. But the rest of the time, we're getting ready for that one day. Uh, <laughs> elections are really complicated. And I think people need to understand that. And I think if people uh, understood also what some of the election needs are now, I think we, we one of them is a huge need for volunteers to work in polling places. Uh, we are we are facing a major shortage, which is getting worse because of the attacks, uh, electronic and other otherwise, on poll workers. But um, uh, the need for volunteers in, in polling centers is, is something huge, which is something which also will go, I think, toward uh, dispelling some of the disinformation because they can tell their neighbors what's going on and what's not going on. Let me stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Super. Adam, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I already and I already said some of it um, and really everything Adam just Adam just said, sorry. Um, a lot of what what I was thinking as well. So I'll, I'm going to reinforce. I mean, basically, call, one of the things we were talking about earlier is um, there's a lot of us out there who want to be informing people of accurate information, want to be building building our faith and our democracy back, um, but we're not as vocal as some of the other folks. So. Keep your ears to the ground. If you if you see or hear mis and disinformation, call it out. You don't need to call it out in a you know in a negative way. I mean, just re, you know, correct correct mis and disinformation. Don't let it sit there unsaid. Um, if we don't do it, who will? Um, speak mm -hmm. out proactively. Write letters to the editor. Write you know uh, help spread accurate information. If you're on TikTok, if you're on Twitter, if you're on whatever. T talk about this stuff in simple layperson terms. And to Adam's, uh, one of Adam's key, key points, uh, be a poll worker, volunteer, please. I have to say being a poll worker changed my life. I probably wouldn't, if, wouldn't be here right now if I hadn't started as a poll worker. You never feel more like you're part of the wheel of democracy as you do when you're mm -hmm. literally assisting people exercising their fundamental right. 
and uh, last, thank an election official every opportunity you have. They get all the complaints and none of the thanks. And again, without them, we would not have a democracy. Thank you. Powerful, powerful, Kathy. Uh, Brandon, yeah, please. Sure. You know, so I, I would I have two messages, one for election officials and, and one for uh, the general public. So for election officials, uh, kind of reinforcing something that Kathy had said earlier, you know, avail yourselves of the resources that are there to help you. Um, some of those resources are provided by CISA, some of the technical assistance that we provide. Um, a lot of the resources are available through the EII SAC and the MSI SAC that, that we sponsor um, through those organizations. You know, we only have 3,400 jurisdictions signed up through the EII SAC uh, out of the 8,000 election jurisdictions across this country. So we still have gaps. We still want more people involved in the information sharing and more people are um, should be taking up the offer of those free services, whether it's uh, additional deployments of Albert sensors, whether it's the whether it's some of the technical resources like the malicious domain blocking, um, and have an incident response plan ready to go. Know how you fit into that, and know where you can reach to support from uh, from CIS, from uh, from CISA, from our other federal partners. You know, to the to the voter, um, to the general public. I think the the message should be pretty clear. Uh, it's to vote participate in it, um, have a plan, and know where to get the information about how to vote, um, know where to get the right information, real information, um, and they know how to spot uh, disinformation and not share it. Uh, so there's a lot of resources that we have available, obviously, on the CISA website, um, but ultimately, we want to direct you to your state and local um, uh, officials so you can find the right information, so you can have a plan to vote and vote and, you know, and then continue to reinforce uh, what both Adam uh, and Kathy said, which is uh, volunteer, um, be a poll worker, be part of the process. Uh, you could observe pre-election logic and accuracy testing. You could see firsthand how election audits are done at uh, election offices, you know, across this country. Um, that is that is valuable information. It kind of strengthens um, the democratic process across the country. And and really happy for the role that we play in it. And we think every uh, member of the public should find a way to to take part. So um, really. Uh, Stan, thank you for for holding this event. Um, a lot of great information shared, uh, and uh, happy to do it. Super, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you as well, uh, Kathy, Adam. Uh, thank thank you so much. I'm very deeply as you know. To me, on the, on the one side, this is a cyber challenge, but on on the other side, and it's, it goes to you know, I think Adam, what, what you mentioned about civics in, in school. Uh, I was blessed to have a fourth grade teacher, Mr. Welch. Uh, and I learned the Declaration of Independence and I learned, you know, the Gettysburg Address. And I mean, I'm in the fourth grade, you know, the preamble to the Constitution. And they've stuck with me for a lot of years. I mean, if if, if you want, I have a book, The Agnostic Patriot, which which uh, is a series of essays on 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 the subject as as it's affected my life. But uh the same thing. I mean, and I'm a, a child of immigrants also here in America. And uh this country means a lot to me, you know, like I know it means a lot to all of you. And and I'm I'm just so grateful that the three of you were able to spend some of your time uh, helping all of us better understand, you know, what's going on and what we all can do, starting with thank an election official. By God, yes. Thank the election official, you know, uh, like the military. Thank you for your service because they truly are. Uh, you, you've motivated me. I'm going to look into being a poll worker, Kathy. See, see what, uh, you know, it won't change my career. That's kind of maybe a little old for that, but but to go play, to go participate, to see what it's like, you know, how exciting. And I think if that's a message for all of us, you know, who are, you know, uh, on 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 the, uh, the, the webinar, you know, get involved, uh, write postcards or, you know, whatever, but get involved and uh if you see something say something you know be an election official all of all of those things so uh we're right now at the bottom of the hour time to wrap it up again let me say adam kathy brandon god so 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 grateful for uh you taking the time out of your busy days to uh help share this information with all of us uh, and with that let me say we're adjourned thank you stan Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day.